Hello, welcome to Church Online at Lifehouse. Hope you are doing well wherever you find us from around the world. Well, we are excited. Today is the last um, message in our Reset series. As we launch into 2021, we've talked about all sorts of great things that can help you have a great year and reset for that. Well, today I want to talk about what we expect is what we get. Um, We get what we expect. That's my topic today. And I want to talk about great expectations. You know, when we think about expectations, um, the question is, does it really matter? Does what we expect have an impact on our lives? Or is it just fate and whatever comes our way just happens? Well, What about the expectations of others, those people around us? Or what about the expectations we have on ourselves? There's so many things we can think about when we talk about expectations. Well, science tells us that expectations do have a very powerful impact on our lives and that they do matter. In the 1960s, a scientist by the name of Rosenthal did an experiment. He had a group of rats and he told his students that some of the rats were highly intelligent and some of them were just average. And he divided them into the two groups, the intelligent group and the average group. He then gave them a maze and he said to his students, I want you to work out which group can navigate the the maze most effectively. Well, Obviously, the intelligent rats did the best job of navigating the maze and they won the race. But the funny thing was, those rats were not actually any more intelligent. They were all the same average rats. The only difference was the expectation that the students had on the intelligent rats. They thought that they should produce a better result. And this is actually called the Rosenthal effect, which Let's summarise it in plain English. English, it is we get what we expect. We get what we expect. So our expectations really do matter. I know for myself, I was doing my final year of high school, uh, HSC in New South Wales, VCE in Victoria, wherever you're from around the world, that final year of school before you head off into work or tertiary education. And I, um, I was just an average student. I wasn't that clever. I was just pretty much mediocre. But I knew the mark that I should be able to get, but I wanted to set myself a target that was about 10% higher than that mark. So at my desk in my bedroom, I made this big poster with the mark on it that I was believing for, that I was aiming for. And throughout that whole year, I kept seeing it. I kept thinking, come on, you can do this. And I was expecting to get to this particular mark. Well, ironically, I got that exact mark. Maybe I should have aimed a bit higher. Anyway, but expectations really do matter. Where do they come from? Why, why, is it from what we think is normal? Yes, our normal, what we've experienced, what we see around us, all these things are what create our expectations, whether it's our family, whether it's our parents, our colleagues, those people around us, what they say is normal, what we see as normal is generally what sets our expectations. But you know what, as we step into 2021, as we step into this next season of our lives, let's be people who let God set our expectations, let his plans and purposes set what we're believing for, not what's around us, not what the economy says, not what other people think, but let's be ready to receive and know that God is with us, that God is ready and able. You know what? We are the children of the the God of the impossible. Our God is bigger and more magnificent than anything we could possibly imagine. Your God has more for you in the year to come than you could have ever thought possible. So what we're expecting really does matter. Now the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1 says this in verses 19 and 20. He says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of God. I know things are going to go well because you've been praying and Jesus is with me. And then watch this, verse 20, he says, according to my eager expectation and hope. 
that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. He is so confident that God is going to work out his situation according to his expectation, according to his belief and trust that God is going to show up. This word expectation actually means intense, persistent anticipation. Intense and persistent (laughs) anticipation. That's a mouthful right there. And, but the thing is, this can be positive or negative. We can um, be expecting good things, but we can also be expecting bad things. We can be expecting a bad diagnosis. We can be expecting a bad phone call. We can ex- be expecting the economy to, to draw back. We can be expecting our job not to go as we planned. All negative things. So Paul clarifies what he is expecting with the word hope because hope is actually positive expectation. It's saying, I know things are gonna happen. They're gonna be good things. They're gonna be things that God has in store for me. So what's Paul really saying? He's saying, according to my intense, persistent anticipation that God will do something good. And as we start 2021, let's make that our our mandate. Let's make that the language on our lives that according to our intense, persistent anticipation that God is going to show up in my life and do something good. Amen. Come on. Now, I know this can sound a little bit crazy that, you know, what we expect is what we attract, but it's true. And, you know, it's not just um, the vibe. It's just not good thinking. It's actually true. The Bible tells us this and shows us this over and over again, that our expectation activates God's intervention. Let me say that again, that our expectation activates God's intervention. I want to um, share this story from 2 Kings chapter 7. And here we find that the people of God are trapped in the city of Samaria. The city's been under siege. They've been there for some time. They've run out of water. They've run out of food. They are so desperate that they have turned to cannibalism. This is a really, really bad state. And the king comes to see Elisha, the man of God, and says, what will happen here? Help us. And the king comes with one of his officers, one of his servants. And Elisha says to the king, he declares that within 24 hours, there will be an abundance of food. There will be so much food, we won't know what to do with ourselves. Now, when you read the scriptures, it's not, I'm going to paraphrase this bit just so it makes sense for us. Basically, he says, today you would spend a thousand dollars and buy a chicken neck. Who wants to eat a chicken neck? I don't want to eat a chicken neck. But tomorrow for $20, you can eat at any Neil Perry restaurant and have whatever meal you want. Wow, you're getting the picture. So we get these two extremes of today, we are starving. Your money can buy you nothing. Tomorrow, your money can buy you whatever you want. There is so much food. So as Elisha says this, the king's officer who is with him says, yeah, right, as if, so unlikely that that's going to happen. He declares his expectation of the situation. So 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 2, he says, look, this is the officer, look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of heaven, could this happen? Even if God, who is so amazing and awesome and can do the impossible, did this, as if it can be as good as you've imagined. So he declares that he expects nothing. He doesn't expect this miracle that Elisha talks about. Elisha says to him, you will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat any of it. So Elisha is confident in his expectation that God is going to show up and do a miracle. And the officer is expectant of nothing. So the following day, the siege is over. Miraculously, there's a shift. You can read that story for yourself. But there's this abundance of food. As the enemy have fled their camp, the people are left with all this food, so much food. Now, remember, these guys have been starving. They are near death. 
Now, if that was happening to you, you would be rushing through the gate to go and get that food. And this is exactly what happens. In verse 17, it says, Now the king had put the officer in charge of the gate, and the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died, just as the man of God had foretold when the king came down to his house. Both of these people, Elisha and the officer, received what they expected, but they were the opposite things. Even though they were in exactly the same time in history, in exactly the same event, in exactly the same circumstances, they both received what they expected. So both science and the Bible tell us that we attract or we create what we expect. I've seen this in my own life so many times. And, you know, we do it even with our children, with the language we use, with what we say. You know, we're like, oh, you're so cheeky. And then when they're cheeky, we're like, why are you cheeky? Well, we, we expected it. We declared it. We say to them, oh, you're rebellious. Don't, you're a rebellious teenager or, or you talk back to me. Why don't we create what we expect? Why don't we talk about what we expect? That, you know, I've, I know that you're a child who's got leadership on your life. I know you're a child with self-control. I'm so proud of you, the way you keep your room tidy, even though it's not. You know, we get what we expect. So let's put out there what we're expecting. Let's be people with an expectation of hope, just like Paul that we're expectant for God to show up because we know who he is. So what are you expectant for? You know, I think it, it comes out in our thinking, it comes out in our praying, and it comes out in our speaking, in our talking. What's on our hearts and what's on our lips? What are we expecting? Are we expecting doom and gloom? or fear and restraint? Or are we expecting miracles for God to show up, for possibility, for opportunity, for new days ahead, for strength, for wisdom, for courage? Are we expecting for these things or are we expecting the worst and being discouraged? Are we expecting for hope for our family, for our influence, for our purpose and our finances? We get what we expect. And God wants us to be expectant of him in our lives. He wants us to lean in because he is great. He is amazing. He is all powerful and almighty. And he has given us great promises. And we can trust those promises because we can trust his character. We can follow God because we know who he is and he has proven himself over and over again. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, him being God, he's able to do immeasurably more. I love that. It's like immeasurably more. It just sounds awesome, doesn't it? Immeasurably more, more than we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us. That's our God. That's how great he is. He, whatever you can imagine, he is greater. He can do more. So God can do it all, but what do we believe God will do? We know God can, but do we believe he will? And he is looking for hearts that are expectant, that are thinking God will, he will. Because our expectations actually affirm who we know and believe God to be. Our expectations actually reflect what we believe about God. They demonstrate our confidence in him. They demonstrate our faith. You know, Paul, um, you know, he has no doubt about God's character. In Acts chapter 27, there, um, he's on a ship on his way to Rome and um, he's with this bunch of people and a storm comes. There's 276 of them on this ship. I love how the Bible gives us these details. But there's 276 important, valuable individuals on this ship. And Paul is on there on his way to Rome and the storm comes. It's, there, it's terrible, darkness for days. And um, they start to throw things overboard. It's desperate. They know that they are in trouble. But Paul isn't looking at the circumstances around him, at the reality. He knows that God is with him. He knows God has a plan and a purpose. He's expectant for God to look after him. Paul is expecting 
the unnatural and the unlikely. And the story is in Acts chapter 27, verse 22 to 26. Let me read this to you. It says, but now, this is Paul speaking to the people on the ship amidst the storm. I must say my brain wonders, how did he get 276 people on the deck? I mean, anyway, word got out and this is what he said to them. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Right there, I don't know if I'd be encouraged, but you know, really knowing I was gonna live, oh, it sounds scary what's ahead, but expectant that God is with us. Last night, Paul continues, last night an angel of, the, of God, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul, you must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. How privileged were they, hey? So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on an island. So we're gonna shipwreck, guys, but I know that God is with us and he is going to take care of us. Now this was day three that the angel speaks to Paul and he then tells everybody on the ship that it will be okay. Day four, day five, day six, they're still in midst this terrible, terrible storm. Day seven, day 14, they eventually run aground. Can you imagine keeping that expectation up for those 11 days, trying to continue to say to, the, to, say to the, that crew, come on guys, it's gonna be okay. But Paul just had such a confidence in God. He'd seen him show up so many times that his expectation was set. And when we are confident in who God is and, that we, and we know he can do the impossible and the immeasurable, we expect exactly that. As we grow in our faith and, and, and God is tangible and we've seen him over and over again, we can just go, it's okay. He's gonna do it again. God has already shown up. He will show up again. We can hang on to his word, the word that he gives us. I was in a car accident many years ago. We were in central Australia, um, heading towards Kings Canyon, which is um, out near Ayers Rock, but far away but close in context out there. And as we traveled on this gravel abandoned road, like there was nobody around, um, it had these corrugated things in it. It was a rough, rough road. And as we were traveling along, we started to fishtail. And then after fishtailing, we started spinning and then we started rolling and eventually we smashed into a tree. Now this was a really bad accident. It was very severe and miraculously, none of us were injured. But at the first moment of losing control, as that vehicle began to fishtail, I heard the God speak to me, a voice so clear on my shoulder saying, you will not die. And at that moment, I felt like I was in a bubble. I felt like I was surrounded by, by just jelly. And as this accident happened and I was present, I could see it, there was no fear, there was no anxiety. I was so confident that God was with me and the word he had given me. You know, the headrest in front of me was actually bent forward. I don't remember that much pressure from my body pushing against that. I didn't have any injuries or bruises or anything that would indicate I'd pushed it, but it was bent. And the only way it could have bent was if I had bent it, but God was with me. I was so, just so aware of his presence. And as his word came to me, I instantly expected his power and his presence. And that's what his word does. Now, maybe you haven't had God whisper in your ear. Maybe you haven't heard him speak tangibly like he turned up on the ship with Paul or like I had him speak that day. You know, from day to day, he's not talking to me like that. But let me assure you that the promises that are in his word in the Bible are for every single one of us every day. And there are more than 7,000 promises of blessing and, and good things from God for you personally that are in his word. And we can rely on that. We can trust in that. We can be assured and expectant of that. 
There's peace, there's strength, there's health, there's friendship, there's wisdom, protection, courage, a sound mind. That's just a few of them. Come on, your God has promises that are abundant for you. But do you expect them? Are you confident that your God will show up with them? We can have intense, persistent anticipation that God will do something good. Come on, give myself a high five because that's who I'm with today. Psalm 130 verses 5 and 6 says this, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my trust. I wait for the Lord more than the watchmen wait for the morning. I remember waiting for my dad at the train station after school. Sometimes, you know, you'd have an after school activity and therefore I couldn't catch the bus. The bus ride was about an hour and a half home, the train and the bus. But if I did something after school, I had to just wait for my dad or mum at the train station. And we lived another half an hour from the train station, so you had to wait patiently. This is in the days of no mobile phones. You had to have your 20 cents and, and go to the public phone if you tried to make a call. And I'd be waiting for my dad and I just knew that if my dad was picking me up, the odds weren't good. The odds were high that I would be sitting by the side of the train station for a long time until probably my mum got home, saw my dad on the couch, asked where the kids are, found out he'd forgotten us and came to get us. But if my mum was picking us up, I didn't have to worry at all. 100% guaranteed she'd be there. 100% guaranteed she was going to show up. She'd shown up before, she would show up again. If she didn't show up, something drastic must have happened. I, had, I didn't have to watch for the car, looking, looking. She'll be here. I know she'll be here. And this is what this scripture is saying about us being able to trust and hope in God. And saying, just like the watchman looks for the sun to rise, if you were a night watchman and you work the night shift and you're waiting for the sun to rise because you know your day will be finished then, you're not thinking, hmm, I wonder if the sun will come up. If the sun doesn't come up, I could be here all for an, forever. No, you are so confident, so expectant that the sun will show up. And that's God. We can be that confident that the sun is coming up and that our God will show up in our situation. God is great and he does great things. We can be confident. His works are great, his thoughts are profound. Psalm 92 verse five, Psalm 86 verse 10, for you are great and you do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Lamentations 325, the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. When we're expectant, when we're looking to God, he shows up. He is looking to bless those who look for him. What we expect matters. Psalm 27 says this, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold, the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I remain confident of this. Get ready. Listen. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Boom. That is expectant. I'm going to see it. I'm going to see God's goodness right here in my world, in my life, in my family, in my workspace, in my, in my plans, in my purposes, in my relationships, in the ability I have to minister to others, in my ability to start something new. I'm going to see God show up, his goodness show up in my life as I plan for the, the, the year ahead. You know, lots of us have been doing online shopping in this last uh, year. Uh, hopefully you've got to the shops in physical way over this Christmas season. But you know, waiting for a parcel to come online, there's a confidence. You know it's coming, you ordered it, you paid for it. And then you're watching, you're waiting. You're waiting for the email to come to tell you that the tracking has started. You're waiting for it to tell you that it's on its way. You hear the doorbell ring and you're like, oh, it could be my parcel. You are expectant, you are, you know, you're confident, you're sure it's coming. And Colossians chapter two verse 14 tells us that what Jesus did on the cross, that what Jesus did for you and I by dying and rising again, that it paid the price. It did the deal. So there is nothing stopping the delivery of God's goodness and God's grace coming into your life. We can be confident about that when we know Christ and we know what he has done for us. Nothing stands between me and God. 
Nothing stands between you and God when Christ has paved the way. So God is ready. But what do we believe? What are we expecting? Am I looking out for him to come? Our expectations reveal our beliefs. Do you believe that you're worthy for God to show up in your space? Do you believe that you are a child of the Most High God, blessed, anointed, chosen, with a plan and a purpose from heaven that is unique, that you are the right person for the job you're in right now? Do you believe that? And if you believe it, then obviously you're going to expect God to bless it. Do you believe he's on your side? He's fighting for you? If you believe it, you're going to expect it. Do you believe that he is your provider, your shield, your protector, your healer? Well, if you believe it, you're going to expect it. So what we believe is reflected in what we expect. So it's time to reset our expectations. I love this story in Mark chapter 10 of blind Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus was sitting on the roadside and um, he's begging and um, he hears Jesus coming. So he calls out, he wants Jesus to come and, and heal him of, of being blind. And he's so annoying, eventually people are like, they're trying to tell him to be quiet and, and Jesus says, who is that? Tell them to come here. So he jumps up and he heads to Jesus. But verse um, 50 of Mark chapter 10 says this, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus, and Jesus heals him. Now, we can easily just skip over that scripture, but it's, it's really significant that he, he throws his cloak aside. Now, the cloak that he would have been wearing was issued by the government as the, um, as the mark of a legitimate beggar. They were given a cloth that would, so that in the community people would know you can give this person donations and they're not a fake, they're not fraud. So when he knows that Jesus has called him, he basically throws off his source of income. He throws off his livelihood, knowing with expectation that when he shows up with Jesus, he will be healed. He is expectant, so confident that he throws off his old way and steps into the new. Now that's expectation, hey? How good is that? What about the woman with the issue of blood in Matthew chapter nine? She's been bleeding for 12 years and she pushes through the crowd and just to touch his garment. And it tells us in verse 21, it says, she said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Expectation. Boom. When our expectation shows up, God meets us right there. She experienced the power of God because she had an expectation. History shows us that when we are expectant, God shows up. And that God is attracted to our expectations because it allows him to be God. It allows him to be present in our lives and seen, tangible and felt when we expect him to be part of what's going on. Our expectations shouldn't be part of, you know, as we think about resetting them, don't make them about what's going on around us. Don't make them about the economy. Don't make them about last year. Don't make them about a news report. Don't make your expectations about your own strengths. But let your expectations be built on God and who he is and his character, that he is the God of the impossible. He is the God who wants to bless you. He is the God who is for you. When we're praying, remind our heavenly father, God, you're with me. God, I love that you showed up for that woman. I love that you showed up for that guy. I love that you helped me last year. I love that you've healed my body in the past. I love that you've given me a great family. So father, right now, because I know who you are and what you've done, I pray right now that you'd give me wisdom for the decisions I've got ahead. Right now, you'd give me vision for the future that is blessed by you. Right now, father, I pray that you would help me to know who to speak to because Lord, I know you're eager to do miracles. So father, I'm expecting you're going to use me to do miracles. That's how we can pray. Let's not be, oh God, if you feel like you might want to maybe use me, um, look, I know if you, like, if you want to help a bit. No, that's not expectation. Expectation is, come on, God, you're magnificent. Show up in my life because I'm expecting to see you. I'm expecting to partner with you. Oh, I hope you're getting excited because... 
As you can tell, I'm excited about this message. I was challenged as I prepared this message that to lift my expectations, to expect the God of miracles to be present in my everyday life, to expect the anointing on the words and the conversations I'm having, that when I'm, that when I'm encouraging someone or speaking to someone, that God would drop into my heart the words they need, that as I'm um, working and as we're making our plans financially, that God would give us wisdom, that he would direct us forward, that my children, that God would be with us in every area that I would be looking, waiting for God to show up. And I pray that's for you today as well. And you would be looking, expectant for God to show up, that as we head into this new year and life starts again, that we would reset what we're expecting from our Heavenly Father, that we would lift our eyes and know that He is for us. I would love to pray for you as I finish today. So Heavenly Father, we know you are mighty. We know you are great. We know we can trust you. We know we have our confidence in you. You've shown up time and time again. And Lord, we pray right now that you would help us to lift our expectation and have it set on you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. And before we go, maybe you have never received Jesus into your heart. You know, that the, the scripture I read from Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, that Jesus has, has made a way, he's taken away the gap. It's like he's unblocked the pipe that was blocked for God and us to have a relationship. And when Jesus died and he rose again, he did that for you and for me. I received Jesus into my heart when I was just eight years old and it was the most beautiful experience. And I've gone on a journey of getting to know him and trusting him. But today, God wants to bless you. God, He is there and He's waiting to have a relationship with you that is intimate, that He can talk to you, that you can know His love, you can know His, His freedom, that you can be free from shame and guilt and doubt and fear and anxiety, all these things God sets us free from. So if that's you today, maybe you'd like to receive Jesus. Maybe you'd like to say, I want to get that connection unblocked. Well, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. So I'd love to pray for you. Would you just, wherever you are, maybe close your eyes, whatever, just for a moment in your heart, say to God, God, I want you to unblock that, 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 that blockage so that I can know you, I love you, that I may sense your forgiveness and sense your love. So Father, I thank you for whoever's praying that prayer right now, whoever's looking to you. And Father, I pray that you would just reveal yourself. Lord, make it obvious that you love them. May they sense your love coming like a flood and that blockage being gone in Jesus' name as you forgive them of every sin, every disappointment, every failure. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Have a fantastic day.